point. The exhibition formed part of the body as a medium of expression, and special emphasis was placed on physical and phys physiological states. An automatic photographic studio formed part of the show so that visitors can affix their own image next to their comments on the, the exhibition. Preprints of an article on the exhibition by Metzger to appear in the December number issue of Studio International was then made available. Jonathan then organized a French program in 1973, and this is, please bear with me for the irony, to celebrate what your company, Britain's entry into the common market, where Dansberger and Roland Barthes lectured. Between 1974 and 2000, Jonathan was director of the Royal Anthropological Institute, now the director emeritus. Jonathan has studied the relationship between contemporary Islam and Unitarian aid since 1993, and has published widely on the topic. More broadly, his interests extend on the one hand to the international aid system, including its relationship with modern media, and on the other, to the growth of new quasi-religious movement and their interaction with traditional religions. He's continuing his study of faith based organizations with special reference to Islamic charities. He has also re been retained by a number of legal teams, including the American Civil Liberties Union. From the study of Islamic humanitarianism, he has gone on to consider the potential for an Islamic humanism devised by Muslims in the light of the human sciences and consolidated in durable institutions throughout the Muslim world. More theoretically, he has explored how a polythetic definition of religion can fruitfully be applied to a number of ideological movements that are in appearance wholly secular and is also exploring how analytical concepts of purity and danger derived from the work of Mary Douglas can be applied comparatively to the, under, to the understanding of many ideological systems, both religious and secular. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan. Warmest thanks today to the university for inviting me to take part in this important and timely symposium, and especially to Svetlana, Mathieu, and Laura for your thoughtful hospitality and the, the excellent organization. Following two highly professional art historians, I intend to use my time to give an impression, as advertised, of the subculture from which the Zagreb Manifesto which both Gustav and I signed, emerged during a short period in my life, 1968 to 73, when I gate-crashed that sub subculture, before being diverted from it to anthropology and the social sciences. But I'd like to begin and end with some general reflections on the, the challenge which the title of our symposium sets, the need for art to change the world. Now, criticizing the world, reflecting its deficiencies, alerting and warning the world, these are well-recognized achievements of art, but changing it. Can one name any community of people that has been actually saved by art? The social sciences are better equipped than the arts to explain how the world should not be as it is. For instance, they can bring to light the deep motivations for racism, religious fundamentalism, violence, militarism, and capital accumulation. But the social sciences turn out to be of limited effectiveness in promoting the kind of radical, ambitious change we're talking about here. I remember the protagonist in Saul Bellow's great novel Herzog of the 1960s says, after witnessing a sordid criminal trial in New York, quote, I fail to understand that this is a difficulty with people who spend their time in humane studies and therefore imagine once cruelty has been described in books, it is ended, unquote. But what of those few whose whole life, considered as a work of art, can really stimulate radical change on a global scale? Some writers such as George Orwell and Solzhenitsyn fall into this category, I suggest and maybe, in retrospect, Gustav Metzger, too. Mathieu reminds me that I wrote of Gustav in 1972, see page 468 of his monumental book, that Metzger is, quote, 
well known for, his, for the Franciscan integrity of his life and for a gentleness of manner punctuated by bitter denunciations of our social and economic systems." Unquote. We are indebted to Mathieu for publishing Gustave's available writings as a form of literature, but Gustave also made use of his own body in a highly expressive way. Who can forget that piercing gaze which faces us in some of the pho photographic portraits we saw on the screen yesterday, or his action painting in a gas mask, or Gustave in a wheelchair surrounded by those enthusiastic young people? At the end of my presentation, I shall ask you to think about the humanist values, religious in origin, that underpinned Gustav's work, and to ask what extent they retain their power today when the biological sciences throw up questions that challenge them. But now to the essence of my paper. I prefer to call this a manifesto because the, the major Zagreb manifesto was a political one issued by the Croatian Peasant Party in 1932. Ours was issued in 1971 on computers and the arts. Now, I hate to read um, things on a screen, but as it's rather small print, I, I think I'll, I'll read the, the whole of this short manifesto, which was delivered um, 4th of May, 1969. The following manifesto from London was delivered to the International Symposium on Computers and Visual Research in Zagreb, Yugoslavia, on May the 5th. A report on this symposium will appear in our next issue, that is, Studio International. We salute the initiative of the organizers of the International Symposium on Computers and Visual Research and its related exhibition, Zagreb, May 1969. A computer art society has been formed in London this year, whose aims are to, quote, to, quote, to promote the creative use of computers in the arts and to encourage the interchange of information in this area, unquote. It is now evident that where art meets science and technology, the computer and related disciplines provide a nexus. We concede that the next 20 years could be spent by artists in exploring and assimilating the potential of existing computers and their peripherals. Some artists, however, are alive to the possibilities which are opening up in the application of advanced techniques for organizing and transforming information. These evolving techniques will respond to an infinite variety of events transform them and offer creative outputs inaccessible to present art. These advances include the use of computers not only for processing inputs into new forms, but also for optimizing the creative potential of the man-machine interface. This interface is perhaps the least satisfactory aspect of present day computers. Because of the rigid mathematical constraint imposed, the design of the internal logic of the machines, and the inadequacy of the existing programming languages for handling information in open systems. A great deal of computer art embodies the limitations of existing techniques. The aesthetic demands of artists necessarily lead them to seek an alliance with the most advanced research in natural and artificial intelligence. Artists are increasingly striving to relate their work and that of the technologist to the current unprecedented crisis in society. Some artists are responding by utilizing their experience of science and technology to try and resolve urgent social problems. Others, researching in cybernetics and the neurosciences, are exploring new ideas about the interaction of the human being with the environment. Others, again, are identifying their work with a concept of ecology, which includes the entire technological environment that man has imposed on nature. There are creative people in science who feel that the resolution of the man-machine problem lies at the heart of making the computer the servant of man <clears throat> and nature. Such people welcome the insight of the artist in this context, lest we lose sight of humanity and beauty. Signed by Gordon Hyde, Jonathan Bentel, and Gustav Metzger, London, 4th of May, 1969. And here am I delivering the uh, the message in, in a, looking rather self-important in Zagreb uh, on the 5th of May. 
Now, I'd like to say something about the background to this, the, the institutions and personalities who were in the background. Uh, taking the USA first, there was the movement called Experiments in Art and Technology, this spearheaded by Billy Kluver, in which a lot of, uh, of uh, artists and engineers took place in a corporate way with very big budgets. There was the journal Leonardo, founded by Frank Molina in 1968, which still survives. There was the Groupe de, Cher de Recherche d'Art Visuel, uh, which was active in Paris between 1960 and 1968, which I was already mentioned. And there was the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, which was headed by Georgi Kepesh, who was a Hungarian. He'd been an associate of Moholy Naj and wrote a lot of books about the environment and humane use of science, big illustrated books, rather forgotten today, but very influential at the time. Then there was uh, the ICA and its assistant director, Yasha Reichart, I'll come to in a moment. Studio International, I'll come to in a moment. The British Society for Social Responsibility in Science and Maurice Wilkins, and that will be a third uh, element in this, which I'll give special attention to. Then the Computer Art Society and PAGE, which we've heard a lot about today. And uh, uh, finally, New Tendencies and BIT International in Zagreb. This was, uh, Zagreb had become a kind of center for experimentation in semiotics and information theory and this kind of thing. Uh, and um, well, Umberto Eco, the very distinguished uh, Italian uh, scholar and semiotician and later novelist, was a regular attender at these meetings. There was a, a flamboyant Frenchman called Abraham Moles, Moles who, who turned up. And a, a big fat book has been published by Margot Rosen on the history of, of New Tendencies and BIT International, which was the the, the journal they produced. This has been published by MIT Press. Uh, perhaps I should also mention that this time in Britain, there was, a, there was the two cultures debate. It was argued by people like C.P. Snow that the world of humanities and the world of science had become too far apart and people were trying to bridge them. And there was quite a lot of, uh, of moral and even financial support for uh, for bridging, for trying to bridge them. Then there were uh, writers like Frank Popper, and um, the, there, were, the, there were also commercial art galleries like the Howard Wise Gallery in New York and the Denise René Gallery in, uh, in Paris. This is the cover of a, a, a very uh, an important exhibition put on at the at the Museum of Modern Art in 1968, rather nicely produced with a tin, a colored tin uh, embossed cover. And with a lot of uh, artists who were adumbrating the kind of thing we were talking about represented. Here is Yasha Reichart, who I think is a rather heroic figure in this, um, the history of this. She was the assistant director of the ICA and curator of cybernetic serendipity. She would never have wanted to be given any special praise as a woman in a man's world. She, she would have thought that completely uh, redundant. But in fact, she was fairly uh, isolated, I think, as a, as, a, as a woman at that time, fairly remarkable at that time. And she put on this extremely ambitious international exhibition, drawing material from all over the world, a great uh, mover and shaker, never properly given all the recognition she, she should have got, I think. Now, we've already uh, been, been told by Catherine about the exhibition. I'd, I'd just like to say something about computer animation, which uh, was uh, perhaps the most immediately successful uh, innovation at that time. These were made by the uh, graphics produced by the, the, the Japanese computer technique group of uh, modulating a square to a picture of a, a woman, I think, uh, yes, and the, the from Kennedy to a dog. This was very innovative stuff at the time, uh, but very quickly it, 
completely transformed the world of film an animation. And all the people in Walt Disney Studios who'd been laboriously drawing frame after frame found that they, were, if they weren't made redundant, they had a new technique which blossomed very quickly into the, into the industry of uh, graphics and titles for films, which now everybody takes for granted was extremely sophisticated. So if, there was, if there's one um, uh, new kind of sub-industry that was furthered by that exhibition, I think uh, computer animation and computer animated film is one that was especially effective. Now, another key figure was Peter Townsend, the editor of Studio International. Uh, I wrote a piece that it, was really celebrating him in a recent special issue of the of Inter Interdisciplinary Science News called The Experimental Generation, edited by Bronach Ferran and Elizabeth Fisher, came out last year. And there's an article about Studio International and its influence, which, uh, which I call it, it's an eclectic vanguardism, because he was also, he was also promoting conceptual art very uh, even more energetically actually but technological art and technology in general was a, was a secondary interest of his and um, it did this is these examples of the kind of coverage they gave of this uh, this field they did they produced the catalog for cybernetic serendipity which you've seen an illustration of and which has now been um, re-edited on I think you can get it online now and um, Metzger's article, Automata in History, which came out in two parts, which has already, already been mentioned. Uh, there was a, 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 a lot of coverage given to Hans Jenny, the Swiss, uh, well, I'm not sure if you can call him a scientist. He was rather in the tradition of Rudolf Steiner and Goethe, developing a sort of um, par uh, Parascience or the study of vibrations, and he took some extremely dramatic photographs of various substances like milk and mercury and all sorts of other things vibrating with very, very quick uh, camera exposure. And um, I worked with Yasha Raikot to put on an exhibition of his work at the ICA in 1969, and Studio took this as the front cover for their um, for their November issue. So those are just examples of the kind of coverage they gave. Now um, I'll come to the three signatures of this uh, Zagreb Manifesto, uh, starting with Gustav, of course. And we uh, um, five screens with computer. This has been covered already. As a, this is probably his most um, gr um, majestic project. It was never realized when. when can't quite imagine how it would be, but it was certainly a, a, a very interesting idea. His two-part uh, article on, um, on automata and history and um, his energetic editing of page. I'd also like to mention his encouragement of young talent. He was extremely generous and encouraging to, to young people, young, some of the younger artists who exhibited at event one. But his critique of technology, whether or not he read these books, uh, I think he, he read a lot of books. He was a book dealer and um, a, a very cultivated man. I, I would be almost sure that he must have read Herbert Marcuse. Everybody was reading him at the time on, on technology, a one-dimensional man. And what Marcuse said about the computer being, as it were, damned by its... Uh, by its role in the Vietnam War, would, was uh, resonated very closely with with, uh, with Gustav's ideas. Also, Raymond Williams, the uh, with his writings on on technology, arguing against the technological determinism of Jacques Ellul and certain other ones, saying that we shouldn't accept technological determinism. Technolo technological rationality is very invasive, and and can dominate all our lives but there's no reason why technology should be like that because it, we can, it can be reconfigured in, in new ways. And there were, there were things going on at the time like the world, the whole earth catalog and a journal called Radical Software. 
I didn't quite mean what we call software nowadays. It was more about sort of general um, uh, tools and things that were available. And just to say a little bit more about the automaton history article that's been mentioned already. He saw kinetic art as being in self-imposed isolation from a 3,000 year old tradition. And in 1970, there was an exhibition at the Hayward Gallery called Kinetics, organized by Theo Crosby. Uh, it produced, it's one reason perhaps why it's not remembered very well is the catalog came in an extremely inconvenient with a lot of loose leaf sheets not bound together. I, I contributed a kind of foreword to, to that, rather supporting and quoting Gustav's views. Gustav said that a lot of this was what he called turntable art. It was just uh, like, a, like a, a gramophone record going round and round and doing, doing un, unusual things, and that really uh, artists could do better than that. And his reaction, as I, I'm sure those who have studied his work know, was to take a car with a container with plants in it and feeding the exhaust from the, the, the car into the, into the container and seeing the plants die and driving this round and round the, the Hayward Garrow. That was a very much um, Gustav's kind of, um, of, uh, of idea of uh, making his point, his presence felt. He, De de deplored the deterioration of the Bauhaus from Idealismus in 1919 to Real Politique in 1923 and later. He referred to the scientists' backlash post Hiroshima, the, the scientists who, like Morris Wilkins, who'd, um, who'd re repented of the, the, the efforts that they'd put into the Man Manhattan Project. He warned against the danger of a technological kindergarten at the ICA, although he, he was in favor of the ICA, but he adopted a polemical stance. He said, the impulse to break up a diseased art world sponsored by nationalist art commissars and catering to a 19th century ego cult is to be, is to be encouraged. Well, nobody could have called Yasha Reichardt a nationalist. She was extremely international, but one knows that he, other kind of people he was aiming at. He took examples uh, from ancient, uh, ancient Egypt and Greece, uh, and also, but also from current robotics and space exploration. And he said that it was chemical, fluid, and biological techniques that were now revolutionary. And he said, observing the step-by-step -step development of technology and automata from Greece, where Aristotle foresaw the automated factory to the possible future destruction of civilization by auto automatically functioning systems, one is faced by the question, were the Greeks philosophers who derided the mechanics right? Well, I think that was a rhetorical question just to inspire uh, argument more than anything. I won't um, dwell on five screens with computer because Catherine has already covered that very well. But I will mention, um, this was something that appeared in Page, the uh, International Coalition for the Liquidation of Art in 1970, which came, uh, which he um, publicized in Page, but he collaborated on this idea with, uh, with some, um, some co-workers. And this is something that's been mentioned already by Mathieu, which appeared in Page, which was the searing, um, picture of a, of a, a Viet Vietnamese girl who's lost her, her, her arms and, fi and fingers. The heart-rending truth behind a statistic in the list of wounded civilians in Binh Dinh province. Little girl, loss of both arms, and the list grows daily. How many Western digits to delete these Asian digits? Uh, so now we come to Morris Wilkins, who is another figure in the background. He was a Nobel laureate, worked on the Manhattan Project, then uh, tried to devote the rest of his life to, to making up for that. He was the first president of the British Social Society, the Society for Social Responsibility in Science, BSSRS, or BUSRAS, founded in 1968. 
later he was criticized for allegedly having having not given enough credit to the work of Rosalind Franklin, who was working uh, under him, and who many people felt and feel ought to have won a Nobel Prize as well as Crick, Watson, and Wilkins for the discovery of DNA. But that's irrelevant to our present theme. The Busserus Science and Art Group was formed after an inaugural meeting of Busserus of the Royal Society in 1968, and he held meetings in his lab at, uh, in King's College London, and uh, Gustav and I attended fairly regularly. Also, Professor David Bohm, who was a, 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 a very uh, important theoretical physicist and worked on quantum mechanics. Uh, he had some very um, definite uh, ideas about how the whole language, a whole language should be informed, it should be revised to take account of what he called the hollow movement in the universe. That is the whole universe is a mass of interfering uh, radiation of different frequencies and that our vocabulary, the way we talk about the world doesn't take account of that was his particular line. Then there was David Dixon, who was a pioneer of alternative technology, wrote a very good book about that. Conrad Atkinson, who was a, 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 a very radical artist, and when I was at the ICA, he put on an exhibition on uh, a strike at a thermometer factory in the north of England, which was um, which was rather in line with, with Gustav's uh, philosophy. And I, I seem to remember he also put on an exhibition on rubbish in London after a dustman strike. I was the uh, the third. Signat well, I was the second signatory of this um, group. Uh, this is, um, you probably can't read that there, but just about my only achievement of, at the time is I was be, be working with IBM. This is a testimonial from Pan American World Airways branch at Hounslow, Middlesex, uh, congratulating my boss on my having completed, uh, allowed the the staff to, to do a, co a computer introduction seminar and saying that um, it would be appreciated if we would pass on to Mr. Tucker and Mr. Bentall our thanks and admiration for their offer, effort and organization in conducting this course and, com and commend them very highly. Uh, we would thank them. They, they said that the um, would this would be of tremendous value to them in the future as we move into the computer age. So that's the sort of work that I'd been doing. But I had also written an article on Roy Lichtenstein in um, a, a journal called Cambridge Quarterly, having seen the big pop art exhibition at the Tate. And uh, my thesis was that uh, Lichtenstein was responding to the collapse of artistic genres and um, the, the strip cartoons and advertising images that he, the, that he worked with were recognized by all so that there's optimal identity between the coding conventions under which the painter operates and those under which we respond. And so minimal leakage of information. The concepts of economy and organization could be applied to works of art as much as living beings, both being successful reversals of the tendency of all systems to decay and run down with time, because I'd been reading sort of standard works in cybernetics and information theory by um, Norbert Wiener and Shannon and um, Ross Ashby. So that's rather how I came into it. Now, the third signatory was um, a man called Gordon Hyde, who, this is rather, this is a sad story really, because he, nothing came of his ideas. He looked like Einstein, and acquired a sort of minor cult around him. Uh, he learned his living by um, translating scientific abstracts, and he tried to, con to design a computer that was no longer limited by conventional logic and Boolean algebra, but was adaptable to systems undergoing continuous transformation in time, and there's a short piece by him in Page. He failed to secure backing for his ideas, and his article in Page and the Zagreb Manifesto are his only memorial. But uh, 
his ideas were not, are not without interest because he, he thought that the, the, the new, are there any mathematicians here? Because if there are, they might um, call me up on this because I'm not a mathematician. I do my best with a very difficult subject. But George Cantor, the 19th century mathematician showed that there are infinite number sets of different sizes. One kind is denumerably infinite, countable one at a time, and another is non that should be non-denumerably infinite, infinite. That is continuous quantities along a line or the square root of two or pi. Hyde's proposal was to treat binary configurations as a series of mathematical spaces no longer in a one-to-one -one relation to the number system. Now, this might appear to be rather uh, aberrant, but a, a great American mathematician called Paul J. Cohen uh, has written some, something that I find in the Scientific American that might, um, might, might make one look at this in a slightly different way. He wrote, the abstract theory of sets is current in a, currently in a state of change, but in several ways is analogous to the 19th century revolution in geometry. As in any revolution, political or scientific, it's difficult for those participating in the revolution or witnessing, witnessing it to foretell its ultimate consequences, except perhaps that they will be profound. That was written in 1967. Now let's look at advanced computing as of 2019. As far as I can see, uh, formal logic and Boolean algebra started by being extremely esoteric abstract subjects and yet became the foundation of the, the modern economy and technology. So far, transfinite set theory seems to have had no, no practical applications. The cutting edge field in computing is quantum computing. There have been some popular articles in the press about this. I have a, a nephew who's working on this in, in, uh, in Cambridge and apparently the lead, the lead in this is, is in the United States, but Britain is holding its own a bit and some other countries like Switzerland are, are progressing as well. Now, if this happens, uh, then it will completely subvert the, the whole um, basis of conventional computing because it's based on the idea that a, a bit can be both on and off at the same time. Uh, as I say, transfinite set theory that Hyde was so interested in doesn't seem to have practical applications for the moment, but abstract mathematical theory is still very important. And it's now called category theory or type theory. So Gordon Hyde was correct to look beyond the, computing, the computers of 50 years ago at the possible future. So let's see what happened to the three signatories of this um, manifesto. Gordon Hyde died disappointed. Uh, uh, there seems to be no obituary of him in the, the annals of the Cybernetic Society. Though Stafford Beer, who was a bit of a maverick, but nevertheless a, a recognized cybernetician, one of the pioneer of cyber, cyber, cybernetics, he gave a Gordon Hyde memorial lecture shortly after Gordon Hyde died, which indicates that he had some time for him. And my belief is that although Hyde's theories are, are not, have not been realized and may not be realizable, nobody actually has, is able to say that they are impossible and, and, um, and useless. I'm reminded a little bit by his life of, um, of Samuel Beckett's belief that sometimes failure is more interesting than success. As for Gustav Metzger, he gathered fame since the, the 1990s, as you know. As for myself, the third signatory, I, I published a book called Science and Technology and Art Today, which were in 1972, which was rather putting together columns from Studio International and adding some more material, but making an, an analogy between computing and photography as being new media that, that came in at a particular time and needed quite a long time to, to make their full impact. After all, photography began in the 1840s, 1850s, depending on where you place the, the origins. 
but people were discovering new things about for not, about photography and its its features well into the late 20th century with people like Richard Hamilton and um, the film Blow Up and uh, many other things have been written about Susan Sontag writing about photography. So its full implications were not evident in the 19th century where artists were sometimes just imitating photography or trying to do something totally different. Uh, I also said that holography was, uh, in, my, in my view, another revolutionary medium, which would take a long time to make, it, make its full impact. I also went on to, to look at what happens when people, people uh, rebel against uh, the technological rationality and technophilia with what I call the, the recoil to the body. And I co-organized a mixed media uh, program at the ICA called The Body as a Medium of Expression in which Gustav took part. But since 1974, I um, really was, had to be completely committed to anthropology having got the job of uh, running the Institute without any formal qualifications in anthropology. So I had to really start from square run to get up to speed with some quite formidable people. But I would say that my work in anthropology has had the has been enduringly influenced by the BSSRS and by Gustav Metzger, because when I started in anthropology in the, in the mid to late 70s, there were a lot of anthropologists who just thought they should do their work and make theories and um, get uh, promotion and chairs and talk to each other. And I w was um, among the first who actually insisted that they, they had to have a more public role and bring their, uh, bring their work more to the attention of the public through a, through a journal I founded. So I, I was definitely, I definitely felt uh, uh, Gustav behind me saying things that, that uh, the same sort of things to anthropologists that he was saying to artists. It's true that I was, um, I was rather pessimistic about automatic language translation because it went through this, there was a huge investment in the 1950s, which all came to nothing. But now in view of what's been happening recently in uh, automatic language translation, I would guess that in what 20 or 30 years, it will be in a completely different dimension. Even somebody who talks very fast like Mathieu, uh, the computer will be able to uh, understand it and register it in digital form which is not possible at the moment, as one knows from looking at Google Translate. But there are lots of people working on this. And that is, um, if it's able to do that, then it's getting very near what one could call, would call really artificial intelligence. Uh, to revisit the Zagreb Manifesto, I, I think it hold up, holds up actually quite well in view of what's happened since. And I did write in the Science and Technology and Art today, so far the constraints of working with the computer so dominate anything done with it that they actually appear to oppose the advances of the artist. It's as if the computer was some creature of great sexual attractiveness whose actual anatomy remains elusive, frigid, and unexplored. So now I'd like to end by showing you something that is much more recent. Sorry, this is the cover of the, the, the book. Uh, a specimen of 21st century post or transhuman art by an artist called Guy, uh, Guy Ben Ari and his team. His is Israeli American, I think. And, but um, where this was pioneered was in Western Australia, the group called Symbiotica, where they have developed um, hybrid techno creatures with in quotes, brains from living neurons and bodies uh, as robotic objects mediated by the internet. And there's a, a, a I'm going to show you a five minute clip of a, a, about a work of his called Silent Barrage, which as you see here, investigates the nature of thoughts, free will and neural dysfunction with a possible spin off in understanding epilepsy. And to conclude, I'd like to say a few things that occur to me as a result of this uh, innovative work. And 
uh, what Gustav might have thought of it and what we should think of it now. Uh, if I can get this going. In 2006, scientists and artists came together in a collaborative effort to explore and expand our understanding of such intrinsic processes as thought and decision-making on a project that became known as Silent Barrage. In a petri dish in Atlanta, a complex network of tens of thousands of neurons are grown in vitro on the scale of one millimeter square and through a grid of 60 electrodes are interfaced with a digital network consisting of multiple robotic bodies. The dish, known as a multi-electrode array, is connected to the robotic bodies, functioning as their brain, directly stimulating them in real time via the internet. Each pole in the arrangement corresponds to a region in the culture dish, and each of the robotic bodies amplifies and accurately represents, by movement and mark making, the electric activity of this real biological neural network. Upon booting up, the robot enters a learning phase with a series of measured tests, the results of which are recorded and utilized as a kind of memory, defining parameters and variables on subsequent reboots. This gives the robots a basis of personality as they draw upon experience to determine their action. In a reflexive juxtaposition, it is the audience that provides the stimulation to which the cultured cells respond. Using cameras and position mapping technology, the movement of the audience within the installation is relayed to the neural network via the electrodes as sensory data that triggers a response, which in turn is sent back to the robotic bodies, creating a closed feedback loop between the neurons, the robots and the audience. The viewers are communicating with the neural network and it with them. The accumulation of marks over a period of time delineates the interaction of the viewers with the neurons. For the audience itself, it's as if they've walked into the brain of a semi-living entity, a biomechanical organism that actually reacts to their presence. The brainchild of Philip Gamblin, Guy Bennery, Dr. Steve Potter, and with the invaluable assistance of engineer Peter Gee and seminal work by Dr. Nathan Scott, Silent Barrage is the culmination of seven years of research and is a continuation of an art and science project named MeArt, the semi-living artist one of Symbiotica's first collaborative projects. A project that grows mammalian brain cells in culture upon a multi-electrode array to form a long-term two-way interface between cultured networks and a robotic arm capable of drawing two-dimensional images. Branching away from MIART, the Silent Barrage team decided to retain the core principles and basic architecture of that project, but to come up with new and novel forms for the artistic embodiment of neural activity as a means to raise questions over the creation of semi-living entities, emergent behavior and agency. Silent Barrage is one of the very few real art and science works in that it is both artistically meaningful and scientifically valid, providing an immersive and overwhelming sensorial manifestation of the questions that are at the core of our understanding of brain-based phenomena, such as proprioception, learning and memory, brain plasticity, addiction and epilepsy as well as informing the public about basic neuroscience, feedback mechanisms, and exposing them to the philosophical questions surrounding cybernetic or semi-life constructs and endeavors. Within the cultured network, nerve cell activity usually occurs when stimulation from the multi-electrode array reaches a threshold. The same can be said of our decision-making. The robot's markings on the pole hint at continuous neural activity, conjuring traces of memories of past actions. Silent Barrage explores the foundations of thought, free will, and neural dysfunction by examining the process of amplification of the microbiological data into the aesthetic macro, conveying the tension that exists between the biological and its informational representations and simulations. The micro-scale biological components give rise to complex macro-scale behavior that is manifestly subtle and unpredictable. Silent Barrage raises questions ranging from engineering and neurological science to ontology, a branch of philosophy that attempts to define the very nature of being. It gives us unique insight into our understanding of the burgeoning relationships between the natural and the artificial, between man and machine. 
between machine and mind, between science and the arts, whilst drawing our attention towards the nature of determinism, its relationship with free will, and the impact of sensory experience on mammalian neural programs. Silent Barrage declares its presence in scale and sound. It invites the viewer to become part of the art, to participate in an ever-changing and shifting landscape of interdependence and evolution, a revolutionary undertaking with vast potential for exploration and interaction. What's the jump that's on the right up on that? How do I do the slides, Joe? Build, build, show, presentation. Yeah. No, it's gone. Uh, there we are. Yes. Thank you. Well, uh, I think it was um, well argued by Iva yesterday that there's a strong Jewish. Uh, tradition and underpinning Gustav's work. And Norman Rosenthal said the same in his essay about Gustav. There's also, I think one could say a Christian element, which comes out if you think about his work in King's Lynn with those, uh, those Christian um, uh, sculptures. Uh, there was a latent Judeo-Christian and Enlightenment morality under, underpinning his work. I, I think we can agree, agree on that. If one wants to think of a, a great, uh, one of the old masters who one could liken to Gustav, it might be Goya. But one must remember he also had this passion for Vermeer, which I don't understand quite because I can't see any political content in Vermeer at all. But we know that he spent several years of his life working on it, he, he discussed it with me briefly, but he didn't say anything particularly, particularly special about it. I imagine that, that with Vermeer, as with many other artists, this, this, the reason he was interested, reason he was impressed by it, was because it offers a vision of an alternative, better world, a promise de bonheur, in the use of the French expre expression. And um, this would, this would um, suggest that there was a side of Gustav that was not wholly devoted to political agitation and, and wanting to, to make change, but, but he, that he valued this kind of contemplative art. Uh, it seems to me that the, the piece we've just seen the, the clip about by Guy Ben-Ari doesn't owe anything to very much to Judeo, the Judeo, Judeo-Christian tradition or to the Enlightenment tradition, it's basically uh, based on a kind of trans transhumanism, talking about uh, half semi-life and about the the uh, doubt that must be cast upon entities like the soul and uh, responsibility, hence on anything to do, anything like the sacred. Now, this, is, this creates a, a dilemma, I think, for those of us who are concerned with the, the big issues of our day, because natural science has not yet presented us with any, uh, uh, any coherent moral system. The, you can um, find intimations of this in Nietzsche and Dost Dostoevsky, but there's a, a German um, theologian called Birkenfurda, who it's called the Birkenfurda Dilemma, that the secular liberal society cannot justify the principles according to which it lives. Uh, people have tried to develop a, uh, a system of morality based on natural science, but I don't think it's been very successful. We still need, it seems, to go back to these, these religious and post-religious traditions. That is the residue that, that religion leaves behind when people cease to, to practice it so, so keenly. So I would conclude by, sorry, I thought I'd got this one already. I conclude by simply asking, what are best moral resources to prevent mass extinction? Should we throw in our lot with uh, 
people like Symbiotica and uh, Guy Ben-Ari, who say that they're doing things for the benefit of humanity? Or should we go back to what I think uh, are the traditional values that are represented, albeit in a, a radical and very challenging form by Gustav Metzger? Thank you, Jonathan. Hello. Yep, working? Okay. Thank you, Jonathan, for such a great talk. I was really thrilled to revisit that moment. And I'd like to begin with the, um, with the obvious, which is manifesto. I understand why, but manifesto. The, do you remember how the use of the word came about at the time? Because it would have been the first time that Gustav would have used the word manifesto since 1964 in naming one of his texts. And I think this is great that he comes with you, with Gordon, with Gustav coming together and proposing a manifesto. I think um, probably the initiative came from, came from Gordon Hyde because a lot of the wording about, uh, about not losing sight of, of humanity and beauty and going beyond the existing computers, that these were very much his ideas. Mm. Uh, whereas the Gustav's uh, contribution was more the questioning the use being made of existing computers. So it was very much a joint effort. I can't remember who is, perhaps the, I, I, I think in retrospect, the word manifesto is slightly pretentious. Uh, but right. <laughs> the, the, I was younger in those days. I, I don't think so. I think it's, it's there. It's, it, it is very much, as we've said before, a document of its time, but it lasts, it, it lasts the test of time. I think that the substance actually holds up quite well. I'm mm. quite pleased with that. No, so do I. And this is why also it's great that you would come, the three of you, together for that. Now, there's so much that, of course, you, I know you, the link with art ends in 1974 in, in terms of working for you, but in this intense year, really you've accompanied Gustav in such a radical way that this is what I would like to unravel a little as well. There are the obvious, as we've just said, the manifesto is one of the keys for these. There is the time that when you were at the ICA, bringing him together to do a show, for instance, but also there is the um, opportunities that you would try, you would give him or try to give him at least, including asking him to write a book in your book series. Yes. Well, it was a book series that was, uh, it was very tightly regulated by the publisher what the series would be like. Mm -hmm. And we produced two excellent books. One was by Raymond Williams on television, which is still uh, referred to quite often because he was a, a major theorist of communication. And it's, uh, although that I think color television hardly come in at that time, he, um, it's, it's, it's a, still regarded as an authoritative book, and also David Dixon's book on alternative technology. Mm -hmm. There was one other book that came in on um, pharmaceuticals, but it, wasn't, it didn't sort of fit the pattern so well. And I hope that Gustav would, would um, produce a synopsis that the publishers would accept. But he, he, he had two kind of individual uh, a mind and to, to fit into the template that the publishers want was too difficult for him, I think, and I wasn't able to, to uh, persuade him to revise it. Mm. No, I appreciate that. Yes. And it is sorry, because we do have the, um, the summary that you yes. proposed in Bombs and Explosives, yes. and it is a fantastic account that yes. I can only dream of the book that would yes. have come out of it. Well, I'm sorry we didn't, I'm sorry I wasn't <laughs> able to push it no, further. There's nothing to be <laughs> There's nothing to be sorry about. It's just, it's another thing that is what I'm trying to really look into right now with you is how you've accompanied yourself in such a, well, more than accompanied, actually, worked together and really offered a critical mind and a critical reflection upon his own work as well. 
was, I mean, that book proposal is one of them. Also, what I really liked was in your archive, you have, for instance, a copy of the 1965 um, lecture, the AA, that with a little note, because you had sent it away to, be to some to people to read it and try to disseminate yes. Gustav's thoughts, yes. philosophy, and ideas. And I think this is also one of the great roles that you've played at the time. Well, I certainly tried. I was always very conscious. He was a very remarkable person. But I must say, I, I wouldn't have expected him to be to have a symposium devoted to him after his death, and I'm delighted it's happened that way. It happened, I think the fact that he lived to a great old age helped. Hmm. Yes. Well, he helped that. We could spend more time yes. with him, that's for yes. sure. <laughs> and talking about the, um, he, you and Gustav, do you remember the day you met? Or the, the circumstances? That... I must have met at the Cybernetic Serendipity exhibition. I, I got into this field really because I visited New York in, in 1968 and I was very impressed by an exhibition at the Howard Wise Gallery by a Chinese American artist called Tsai, Tsai Wenying, who I wrote about, I read various catalog entries and an article for Studio International about him. He was a, an artist who used uh, non-traditional techniques in a traditional way he wanted to he uh, wanted to, he used um strobe lights and um and uh other techniques to, to create sh shimmering forms mm. uh, rather like low animal low level animal life so like uh, sea anemones or or, um, or or plant particularly sea anemones and um not at all wanting to to make anything robotic that looked like a like a a, a mammal, uh, and they, I thought they were very beautiful. And in fact, looking back, they they re represent a, a, a very Chinese Taoist view of life of the uh, unity between nature and and art, and trying to make something. Uh, mechanical which in fact gets very close to nature mm. which is but it's it was you could say it belonged to the analog period of technology rather than the dig digital period it didn't use co computers it used very sophisticated uh, electronics which he he tuned these these pieces these rods himself as if like, like tuning an, an instrument right and he was a friendly with gustav and um I think I met them both at the at Cybernetic Serendipity, which was a huge sort of meeting place for interested people at that time. Right, and also you told me that story, which was rather interesting, because of the cost of that exhibition when you got the tenure of the ICA, it it proved to be harder to mount exhibition of that level again afterwards. Yes, Yasha Reichardt was a, a brilliant um, exhibition organizer. She put on another uh, major exhibition called Play Orbit about toys all over the world but her exhibitions co uh, cost a very large amount of money and the ICA had some financial problems and I think that was the reason they let her go and went in for rather cheaper exhibitions right um, which was not good for her career mm, no but however it was great for them I mean for what you could do afterwards well Gustav Metzger's exhibitions didn't cost very much yeah yes so unfortunately, as far as I know, there's no photographs that have survived of that show. And um, can you tell us a bit of the memories you may have of it? Well, it was, uh, he, it, it, the, the gallery walls were papered with photographs from the business pages of the newspapers. And he, he contended that there was a particular kind of, um, of demeanor of these, these hard-faced men who were controlling the economy. And at the same time, we had photo me booths where people could go and pay 10p and have their own photographs paid. I, I, that's, I, that's really all I remember about it. There, there was an article that he wrote about it in mm. Studio International, which explained what he wanted to do. And that's an example of his interest in the media, right. which I think grew from that, that time on. Exactly. Yeah, that's yes. the time he would develop the idea of mass media yes. and use of newspapers in order to highlight these concerns. Yes which um, I think is fascinating because of course, what's also brilliant about that very show is that at the same time, the same is another exhibition by David Medalla and John Duggar. And I really love the idea. Of course, you have again, Medalla and Metzger together because they were both- They were building a, a, a house 
because it was supposed to be low cost housing built with plastic tubes in the gallery, uh, which, um, because they were going through a very Maoist phase. Yeah. But I remember the following month, I was organizing a French program to, to um, celebrate the entry of Britain into the common market, which uh, has been a rather ill fated period of history as we're now moving out of it, unfortunately. But the, the um, interviewer from Le Monde uh, asked me about what um, ab about the exhibition policy of the ICA, and I said, well, they'd had these um, the artists who were who believed in in revolution through art, and he said, ah, c'est la révolution subventionnée, which I'm afraid was true. It was all um, it was all rather uh, playing about the David Modell and um, I mean, it really had nothing to do with low cost housing in China. It was the, the passion of the time that um, certain leftists had for, for Mao Zedong. Which yeah, but also, I mean, it would, it would highlight in them. In the... Gustav never fell for that. I never heard him. I never heard him praising Mao Zedong. Yeah, no, neither. Can Did anybody you? remember that? I don't think so. But one remember that, must remember this time, I mean, when I was in New York discovering technological art, this was the same time it was the, um, the student movement in Paris. Right. But I think that I think that all the, what we've been talking about today and yesterday didn't really have very much relationship to uh, to what was going on there and to the to the to the the um, agitation by the students and everything it meant for for politics. Mm. I think it was rather rather passed that by. Right. There weren't very many connections. And I, as far as I know, Gustav was, um, so he certainly didn't go in for the, anything to do with sexual liberation or anything like that. I don't think that interested him at all. The other thing which I, w I wanted to bring as well was the, the link between the exhibition that uh, Gustav would do back then and the body as a medium of expression. Yes. I find it extremely interesting that this exhibition will happen under the frame, under the umbrella of yes. that um, whole program. Can you, do you see some, um, can you highlight the obvious things for you to invite Gustav as part of the, um, this endeavor then? Well, it was the, I suppose I was trying to do something at the ICA which would counterbalance all this, um, this uh, te technological art and things associated with it and look at a completely different um, tradition in art, which was what, what I call the recoil to the body, which also is related to going back to nature. And um, it was a mixed media program with uh, academic lectures combined with, uh, with exhibitions and all sorts of things like encounter groups. We had an, an, a Californian style encounter groups with people going around in circles, clasping their hands in when they were told to stop, they would have to hug each other, things like that. And we had um, a, a deaf sign, deaf children's theater doing teaching the, the general public about um, sign language and mm. those sort of things. So it was a sort of mixture of quite high level academic stuff which went into a published book. Yeah. And, um, and uh, a lot to do with dance and also fashion, because my collaborator, was more interested than I was in fashion. Mm -hmm. And the other thing which is striking about that series of program you wanted to do, of course, is the first one, this one, the ecology in theory and practice, yes. which somehow brings us back to your concluding remark today, which the, um, what are our moral resources to prevent mass extinction? I really like the fact that we come back to that question yes. that you raised as early as 1970. Yes, but of course it was, uh, these were issues that had been raised by by many um, ecologists and environmentalists at the time. It was just at that point becoming a, a mass movement. Friends of the Earth had been founded in, in the United States. And uh, the, 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 as a result of our meeting at the ICA, there was a Friends of the Earth British section uh, that was founded. Mm. But I came to the conclusion that, um, that anthropology was the subject that, that would have more to, to say about the environmental crisis than ecology uh, as such. So yeah. that was one reason why I transferred my interest to, to anthropology, particularly social anthropology.
But just to conclude a, a little remark on the um, on the book, I have the American edition, yes, which had a different quote, right, that didn't, than yes. the other one. Can you tell me? Uh, yes, we we uh, we were able. We had a quote here from Jeremy Hopkins: "Generations of trod, of trod, of trod, and all is seared with trade." But we had an extra quote for the English edition, which came from the doors. What have they done to our fair sister? You can probably go on with the yeah. words. Uh, anyway, it's some beautiful lines from the doors, but we weren't allowed to publish them because, well, as I think it's still the case today to publish even a few words of a pop lyric is immensely expensive. So the publishers insisted on cutting it out. <laughs> that was a great story. I wanted to share it with you. Yes. My dear friend, join us. Thank you very much, uh, especially for your last question, um, which has made me so nervous to respond to and feeling so insecure in my response that my voice is shaking. But this is the response I want to give. I think the question about asking about morality is the wrong question, because morality is always about good and bad and right and wrong. And I think that we have to worry about those values that are uh, ensconced in religions. And um, I came to my studies of trauma because I was so concerned about the impact of the increase in trauma uh, throughout the world and the behavioral responses that uh, are part of it um, from uh, great accomplishments like Metzger's, which are very rare, to people completely incapacitated or violent themselves who have no center and whose center, and I'm, I'm talking about complex trauma. I'm not talking about my dog got killed on the road. Um, and connected to that, uh, research, I became involved uh, with horses and deeply involved with animals and animal intelligence and what it's like to be with an animal, especially a big animal like a horse uh, that is so sensitive that can hear for 30 miles, that whose ears radiate uh, and they run from danger, they rarely confront. And then I started reading about nature and how trees talk to each other and how the roots of trees, of course, have companions. And then I had a, a really, really incredible experience. I had two huge paired pines across a walkway, huge. Uh, and one of them started dying. And I thought, oh, no, I have to. Um, cut it down because it's dangerous if it falls over on the street or someone. And we, we cut it down and it had died in its heart. And then we saw the other tree starting to die and we cut it down and it died in exactly the same place. And that all of these things that I'm uh, relating to you have come to me to replace any kind of thinking about religion or morality in the sense that it's passed down from philosoph our philosophers and to and to really think about all the work that's incredible work being done on uh, uh, cephalopods, the intelligence of, of octopi, uh, the intelligence of all the, the birds that can create and so forth. And I honestly think that um, the 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 uh, what's it called? Um, the project we just saw, Silent Barrage. I think Silent Barrage is the future for human beings. But I think it doesn't have to be if we take a very, very close look at nature, just as Metzger said. And I think that had he been able to live longer, he would have um, probably agreed with what I'm saying. 
Very interesting. I, I'd like to think about that, not give a snap response. Thank you, Christian. That was really good. Mm. The clearer the answer seems to be to me, they're so, they're so smart now. And, and you know, the other thing that I've been noticing, I stayed on Facebook just for this one thing, that people are posting uh, videos of animals all the time rescuing each other. Not, you know, a, a, a cat and a deer and, a, you know, animals that normally eat each other. They, you know, they're so much more ancient than we, and they know how dev how devastating we are and how destructive we are. And I, I have a thought, a hope, a, a, an irrational feeling <laughs> that they are the answer. I think these are very interesting ideas, but the history of political thought suggests that when people use biological uh, metaphors, to discuss social issues, there's a danger of it going very far wrong because after all, nature is also red in tooth and claw as there's the two sides to nature. I'm talking about actually seeing the world. Mm. I'd like to think about that. Christine, it's all right. When I can come back to this idea of, yes, me too. <laughs> but the, the, the thing is, because we talked also to Boyce about Boyce, and he was the founder of the party for animals, and he was also thought of uh, that the animals, they were before us, but they are in that way, they have more progress because they were before us. Um, so I think this is, uh, a, yeah, a, a sort of <clears throat> of going away from this dialectic morality thinking. But, um, and that's what I want to ask uh, Jonathan, that, um, um at that time and i'm coming back and now i have to relax but at that time as you published this book in 1972 there was and i'm relating a lot of times to this talk uh, at uh, the ica in 1972 but uh, gustav said at that time that he was uh, um in a lot of gatherings where the idea was not bringing our technology to the foreground looking to alternative what is uh, yes. Dick, David Dickens, Dixon, Dixon, not, yeah. Um, uh, thinking maybe it's very influential also in that um, time for Gustav, perhaps, yes. because then he posed this question to uh, to uh, Joseph Beuys: uh, Why we should go on in that sense of creativity? Why we should go on from Aristotle to Einstein to uh, to the Third Reich? in that sense of, of technological progress in the bad sense. So I don't know, I think that would be my question, how you discuss this strange form of what we are maybe suffering now or thinking how, where's the solution about morality and, and um, yeah, kind of, human progress, even if we know that we are, have the roots in nature and thinking of environment. Well, there's a, there's a danger that this could collapse into a sort of new age of philosophy. One member I didn't mention of the Bussra Science and Art Group was called Jill Pass, who became Stockhausen's companion and muse, and, but she, and she was encouraged by Maurice Wilkins to get interested in spirals because of the, the fact that spirals are to be seen in, in um, at various uh, levels of, of evolution. But she became a, a sort of full-blown New Ager uh, and interested in, um, in the occult and, and those kind of things. 
which I I felt was rather against the spirit of the of this um, this group, and I think the the new age the, the new age sensibility is it becomes as a kind of substitute for the religion the, the great religions which are felt as having failed. I personally think that that to throw away the the, the ethical heritage of the great religions or the best one can identify in them would be foolhardy because that's not enough to to replace them with and they and all these all these religious traditions contain within themselves seeds for reconstruction I mean, the the christian idea of man as dominant dominating over nature has has um completely uh, opposite uh, counterparts uh, which have been emphasized more in, in recent years. I was a trustee for some years of an organization called the Alliance of Religions and Conservation, which attempted to get the, the world's religious leaders to take um, ecology and conservation more seriously. The argument being that uh, politicians look about two or three years ahead, businessmen five or 10 years ahead at the most, the religious leaders are thinking about people's grandchildren and all the world's religions, if you look closely, have some kind of, um, of, uh, of tradition of, of being sympathetic to, to, to conservation rather than Im imposing um, man-made structures on, on them without any qualification. And that this is something worth uh, teasing out as a resource. It's not the whole solution, obviously, but it's, uh, it, I think it's a pity, it would be a pity to, to jettison it. And the idea is that, um, the idea that animals communicate with each other, of course they do, but they communicate. The, the biologist von Uxkuhl shows that each species has a highly sophisticated means of communicating within the species. They're only interested in, in the other, other members of the species, really, for the most part. And as regards um, as regards the most meaningful kind of communications, as, as it apply to whales or insects or any kind of of uh, of uh, animals, but it's rather difficult to transfer this to human beings with our huge weight of institutional structures. Um, I just would caution us not to rely on reductive terms like new age that dismiss uh, really complicated uh, arguments and, and knowledge bases, because that it's a way of, it's a way of, of um, tagging and, and minimizing. I agree, yes. Thank you. Um, I just sort of maybe try and move this on a little bit, some, somewhere else, but back, back to the question um, about what we're all facing at the moment, this idea of mass extinction and how do we address it and how does this relate to, to the stuff thinking? And I think go back to the comment that, that you made just a moment ago about uh, how involved Gustav was at the time of being involved with the Computer Arts Society and at the time of the Zagreb Manif Manifesto with the student uprisings and all of that, which was not very much at all. And I think one of the, the things that, that I made, that, that made me think about was his involvement with the Committee of 100 in 1960 and 61, because Gustav, in a sense to me, always I thought of as quite a realist. Um, he didn't do things unless they could happen quite often. And his involvement with the Committee of 100, it was very central, he came up with the name. He was one of the original founders with Ralph Sherman and with Bertrand Russell. And he, his approach to uh, the Committee of 100, and you have to remember that this comes after a long period of uh, very involved activity uh, that goes back to the North End protests in Kings Lynn, the actions of the direct action group against uh, 
nuclear war, which was a precursor of CND, then involvement with CND and uh, the setting up of the Com Committee of 100, he approached this because he felt that it could make a difference and that it could only make a difference if it was organized and it only made a difference if that organization was about a bringing together of people and it had to be enough to make an impact that would force a change of point of view and the initial activities of the committee of 100 were so successful that he ended up going to prison for it and that moment of when that group of about, I think it was 37 people, something like that, that went to prison, it sort of, in a, in a way, tore the heart out of the Committee of 100, not because more demonstrations didn't happen, they did happen, but they were disorganized. And at that point, the group started to fall apart. And I think that Gustav, after that, time he didn't well, after he came back out of out of prison he didn't go back to work with the committee of 100 he distanced himself from it and he distanced himself from that kind of activity not because he didn't believe it could change anything but because he didn't feel that the structure that the, that particular group now had was one that could really affect proper change and i don't think he really involved himself in those sorts of group activities um, until right towards the end of his life. And I think the idea of Remember Nature, um, which again was about people coming together around the world at one particular moment, which is now very much in its in its ideals, very close to the way in which Extinction Rebellion has been uh, very, in a very organized way, working internationally at specific moments to, to do things. But what I what this comes back to, in for, for me at any sense, is this word responsibility, because Gustav had um, a very strong sense of responsibility. He was very involved as, as you said, with the British Society of Social Responsibility and Science. And he, but he also, I think, towards the end of his life, was interrogating, reinterrogating his background, his upbringing. He was brought up as an Orthodox Jew. And, you know, most of his life, you wouldn't really think that he was brought up in that way. And, you know, he sort of, kind of ran a mile from that kind of religious framing. Um, but I think in the last decade or so of his life, there was a sense in which one of the central tenets of, of Jewish life came to the fore, and that was a responsibility to existence. And that I think is, you know, it's not new age, it's not, it's not a morality that one can, you know, address in an ideological point of view or in, in, in a, you know, it's a, di it's a direct thing and it's something that's inside of everybody. And if it's organized, change can maybe happen. I mean, it needs something radical. Sorry, and then we'll end that. We, we conclude with Sorin. I, I want to thank you uh, because I now, and also thank you because I now read something which is uh, in Damaged Nature, uh, the image of uh, uh, what we saw in the first, uh, in, your, in your lecture, in the uh, Neuschwanstein and the cathedral. And uh, as you said, he comes back in the late ages of his religious uh, idea. But when I saw these pictures, to, the, the, these images at the first time, <clears throat> I thought, okay, this is the clearly idea of uh, of what the nature was, the surrounding, and now we have to shelter them. But 
on the other hand, it is also a religious idea. I think that's what you maybe gave to me or something. It's more, uh, and it's not maybe Christian, it's not maybe Jewish, it's, but something uh, he was thinking about. And the New Age, I don't want to, to talk about New Age, but I want to say there was a very good exhibition about the whole earth, which is part of this New Age thing. And just the idea that, that uh, in, in that moment where we could look through the earth from, 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 from above, that the people also thought that the, the resources are uh, and not endless. So, but yeah, so that's what I want to say. <laughs> so, uh, oh, thank you. This Simon. picture, new. Right, thank you. Jonathan, a last word? Well, on this question of religion, I feel pretty strongly that, that uh, there's a kind of religious, something like a religious impulse, which is universal in human beings. And if it is, if, it, uh, if you throw religion out of the door, it will come back from the window. And maybe the, the example of someone like, like Gustav, I'm not suggesting that there should be a kind of cult of Metzger, but he, I think he will be uh, an example to people. And we may find that there's, there are new forms of um, institution developing that will, that will draw on some of his ideas. Uh, I, I'm sorry to have used the word new age in a pejorative way, but I, it's a sort of shorthand for, for, uh, because there are obviously there's a, there are a lot of very sincere thinking people who are, who are um, thinking along these lines. But uh, I think the, the, one of the lessons that we learned from Gustav is you, you, you can't just turn your back on science. You must try and reform it and learn from it and work with scientists. And he, I think he provides an extraordinarily good, good model for doing that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you on this word. I want you to welcome, to thank with me, Jonathan. And I uh, would seven, seven, seven. And I welcome you back at seven for a discussion with Andrew Wilson. And I'm really, really looking forward to that too. Thank you. Little break. And thank you so, so very much.